Hey, hey everyone, back again. Today I'm going to talk about Laura Mulvey's idea of the male gaze. Also, I'm going to be talking about how she deploys the idea of scopophilia because they really go hand in hand. Now, before jumping into that, if you want to follow me anywhere other than here, you can find me on Instagram at theory underscore and underscore philosophy or on Twitter at David Guineo. If you're new here, welcome. I try to explain philosophical texts and ideas in a way to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends who knows they might get a kick out of it. Uh, if you want to help me out, do all those things. You can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but obviously no pressure. If uh, you found this in podcast form, you're going to be able to find the video on YouTube, or sometimes I release other videos as well if you're interested in that. Or if you found this on YouTube, you're going to be able to find it in podcast form where there shouldn't be any ads. So yeah, don't waste any more of your time with that stuff. Let's talk about Laura Mulvey's The Male Gaze. Now, I've done a full episode on this essay, Visual Pleasure in Narrative Cinema, which is very good, and I recommend you go listen to that or go, go read the essay, but I just wanted to do this shorter one so that anyone curious about the term, the male gaze, could have a pretty good understanding of it. So what Mulvey tries to do in her essay, Visual Pleasure in Narrative Cinema, is to use psychoanalysis to psychoanalyze cinema. And she thinks that the cinema is a reflection of everyday life. So in that way, she is using psychoanalysis to study the cinema as a way to study everyday life. Now this goes beyond what is seen on the screen, that is the content, but also the form of the cinema itself. So what happens on screen can probably be easily understood uh, as, as reflecting certain societal values. But one of the points that she makes that's really interesting is how the act of viewing the screen, and she describes how when we sit in the cinema, we sit kind of isolated uh, in the dark, the way that it's the cinema is uh, set up, you don't see the people in front of you, at least you shouldn't be, you don't see the people beside you. You're kind of alone, peering into the lives of people on the screen. Now this speaks to what she calls scopophilia, drawing from psychoanalytic theory, which is a desire to look. Now this desire is augmented when it is the act of looking into somebody's private life because you're being streamlined into something that you aren't supposed to be, and that elicits some excitement. And this speaks to a desire to understand and control, because when you put something under your gaze, when you are looking at something, you make it intelligible to you. You make it something that you can understand. And it is also something that suddenly now you can't fear because you have a perfect view of it, and it has no view of you. You have total command over it in a kind of symbolic way. Not symbolic in any psychoanalytic term, but, but symbolic in a colloquial way. So the cinema itself satisfies this desire of scopophilia, this desire to be looking. Now the content of the cinema satisfies another desire, and this desire reflects the interests of men, and this is what she calls the male gaze. So what is seen on screen is going to appeal primarily to men within a socio uh, economic setting in which men hold primarily dominant positions. So on the screen, this can be reduced to two different kinds of personalities. There are either women presented on screen as objects to be looked at by men, viewers, or there are going to be strong male characters that the men can see and try to become. Now in psychoanalytic terms, these men on the screen occupy the role of the ego ideal. So men watching have an image of what they want themselves to be like, and that image is going to be fostered by certain strong characters being presented on the screen that serve as their own possible ideal, who they can try to emulate and become. Now, in many of these films, and keep in mind she was writing this in 1975, so the films that she was drawing from reflect at a certain stage, not to say that things have changed too much, but there are qualitative differences. On the screen, men would often be the ones occupying very active roles. And on the screen, women would often be occupying passive roles, just objects for men on the screen. And one of the ways to assess this is by using what's called the Bechdel test for anyone that's not familiar. The Bechdel test is a test applied to film to see if two women within the film, I think sustain a conversation together for more than a minute where the conversation doesn't talk about a man and see how many films actually do that. And as soon as you're made aware of that, suddenly all films seem to fall short of satisfying what seems to be the most basic criterion 
women in film very much up to this day are meant to occupy only passive roles. They are meant to accompany men to be looked at, not heard. So these dynamics that we see on screen where women occupy passive roles and men active roles is mirrored in everyday life. Women are expected to take on certain passive roles in work life, in home life. And even when they do assume active roles, those roles are erased. So for example, housekeeping, which is something that women are expected to do that demands a lot of labor, a lot of decision making, but those actions often get erased under the burden that men experience in their daily lives as being the only people that can experience burden, that can experience the weight of obligation. Just because women's labor has been so naturalized, has been assumed as a given, and there's very little room to challenge it, to call attention to it, and it has disappeared into transparency. So by using psychoanalysis on the film, Mulvey gives us a way to understand our world because we can use a film being a set amount of time, a set amount of content, and we can assess it through this analytic framework, which then, because it's a very neat thing, what happens on the film, and then from there we can extrapolate it to everyday life and test it against what goes on in everyday life. And we come to find that the cinema reflects certain impulses, certain societal dispositions that benefit men at the expense of women. Now it is a little bit more complicated than that, and I kind of touch upon that in the essay, but there are also critiques of Mulvey by certain critical race scholars who say that, yeah, there are these patriarchal configurations here, that is the continued oppression of women by men. But we can't forget the fact that women have often subjected black men to this male gaze, including Asian men as well, subjecting them to a female gaze, a white woman gaze, which speaks to the need to adopt an intersectional approach to this framework. It's not just men utilizing their social power against women. We see these same dynamics unfold between across race as well, where white women deploy this against black men and white men deploy this against black women. And that's a very different dynamic, one that should be considered that Mulvey doesn't really touch upon, which isn't necessarily a critique, she just didn't write about that, but it's an important thing to consider. And that's about it. If there's anything I excluded, I'd love to hear about it. If I got anything wrong, I'd love to hear about it. If you like what I did, like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, and yeah, catch you next time. Take care.